an amazing community on the coast. It has constant movement, and it's home to some of the most bizarre little characters you'll ever see. We're going to drop down and enter a world most people overlook. Have you ever looked a crab in the face? These are fiddler crabs, named for the obvious reason that the males have a claw resembling a fiddle. They actually look more like little conductors, leading an orchestra with confidence and passion. Some so carried away with their mission, they fall over backwards. But these funny little fellows are carrying out some very serious business. During mating season, they wave those claws to attract females. Only males have that one large claw, and even though the average fiddler body is an inch wide, the fiddle claw can be up to two inches long. Size definitely matters in this ritual. The bigger the claw, the easier it is to see. Their eyes are on stalks, making them look a bit like aliens but when you're this low to the ground, every half inch helps. Females may check out from three to 100 males before choosing a mate, and she's looking at more than that claw. Each crab has a burrow, the hole they scurry into if there seems to be a threat. Male crabs will build a hood or stack mud balls around one side of their burrow as a type of protection device. When a female starts checking them out, that burrow better be in tip-top shape. Because if she chooses him, they will go into the burrow, he will plug the hole, and that is where she will have her eggs. Watch this fellow try to impress. The lady comes over to check out his mud stacking. He's waving madly. Ah. But alas, she doesn't like what she sees and moves on. His mud balls are not in order. Dr. Elizabeth Wenner is a retired research marine scientist who has written more than 80 scientific papers, many of them dealing with crabs. These organisms are a vital and important part of the ecosystem. They provide food for numerous other organisms besides humans. And, um, and they're intensely interesting creatures. Fiddlers travel together in groups that number into the thousands. Even though they seem to operate as a colony, crabs are very aggressive, and those claws are also used for defending territory or standing ground between a female and an intruder. The crabs have 10 legs, all that are in this group called the decapods, deca meaning 10, poda meaning the feet. So they decapods. Have decapods. And that's the group that they're all in, the lobsters 
The crabs, the hermit crabs, they're all in that group, the true crabs. Fiddler crabs are easy for anyone to see, but you have to be very still and patient. It won't take long before they emerge and start digging. stop and sometimes they dig out uninvited guests just watch this guy knows something is in there that shouldn't be them constantly taking right. their claws and what yeah. is what is what are they doing they're they're taking the um, the algae or any other little um, critters that they may find and then they are processing it in their mandibles and then what they do is they roll it up into little balls and and then they discard it so they're actually rolling it around sort of like um, that we do with something on our in our mouth and, and tongue and then they spit they get all the good stuff off it and then they spit it out Wenner gets a kick out of fiddlers, but she's really hooked on blue crabs and their mating rituals. First, the female molts because her body has grown larger than her shell. Crabs actually step out of their old shell and at that point are extremely vulnerable. When the female becomes soft, the male will cradle carry her. Actually, he just hovers over top of her and cradle carries her upside down. She's upside down. Their pheromones are given off, and then what will happen is he will flip her over, she will actually shed her exoskeleton, and then he will mate with her, and then he holds her in that position until she becomes a paper shell, hardens up some, and then he releases her. There are more than 5,000 species of crabs in the world, while many live in freshwater and on land, crabs are found in all of the world's oceans. The constellation Cancer and the astrological sign are both named after the crab. Crabs play a major role in the ecosystem. They impact oysters, a keystone species, which, as UGA professor Jeb Byers explains, are necessary for the survival of entire habitats. So each individual oyster is filtering liters of water per day, and so you can imagine that collectively these oysters are filtering and cleaning a large portion of the water that's out here uh, in the estuaries. And then also we know that the oysters are stabilizing sediment. They're keeping shore banks from eroding and they're uh, controlling the rate that sediment is suspended in the water column. So these are very important things that oyster reefs do for us. Byers is studying the relationship between oysters and crabs because crabs are a very important part of oyster survival. Some species eat oysters, others hide in the oyster reefs, while blue crabs eat the crabs that eat the oysters. And just remember now, we have our mud crabs down here. Oh, cool. So this is the crab that we've taken out of the oyster shell, that, well, one of the species in particular we needed to get out of there, and these are mud crabs, and these are larger ones. And you can pick these up, usually they won't pinch you too bad. <laughs> what does so, that mean? Uh, <laughs> take a smaller one. Here we go, I'll get you one. Ah! We have a few different species of mud crabs here in Georgia. This one's, ah! Called Panopius, that's the genus name. So this is a crab that loves to eat oysters. It eat, usually eats smaller oysters because it's a smaller crab, but although they do get bigger, and it lives on the oyster reef, and it also eats oysters, so it's living, it's eating its this home. This eats an oyster? That'll crack open small oysters, yep. Pretty exclusively, that's what it eats. Yeah, I got a chunk of my, the palm of my hand, so I... <laughs> and so, this is called a mud crab. That's a mud crab. We have several species of those in Georgia. We want to see how these guys are eating them. One of the things about crabs is that they are 
Well, as you know, the, our word crabby comes from the fact that they have kind of an attitude. Yeah. And crabs are noted for eating each other and for at least being very aggressive to each other. So they're very cannibalistic. Wow, I, would, I didn't know that. So the, big, big, the size means everything when you're a crab. So big crabs will often eat smaller crabs. This is all prep work for a big day tomorrow. And rinse them off a bit. Baby oysters and clams will be placed in net cages with 30 bushels of clean oyster shells so the babies will have something to latch onto. We will leave before daybreak to set up an experiment that determines what impact crabs and other coastal critters may have on the health of oyster reefs and subsequently our estuaries. Wow, it's heavy. So what are you gonna do with this? So these are our oyster spat. They've been epoxied on here onto a numbered tile, so we know the sizes of all of these. And we're gonna put them out in the field into our different cages that have, some of them are gonna be exposed to crabs, some of them are gonna be protected from crabs, and we're gonna watch what happens to them over the course of the summertime. You can track again the survival. There's your word for the day. A baby oyster is called spat, S-P-A-T. The spat has been glued onto tiles, and each tile has a number. That will allow Byers and his students to track the survival and growth of these individual oysters. But wait until you see where we have to go. We head for a spot just over the Georgia line in South Carolina. Jeb and his students have already set up some of the cages. They have tried this experiment in other places but the rise and fall of tides were so strong, it washed the cages away. Third time's the charm, or so we hope. You put the tiles in each one of these cages? Yeah, every cage is gonna get certain things that are all the same. It's gonna get some of these sub cages, it's gonna get a basket of, a bushel of dead oyster shell to lay the foundation, it's gonna get six spat tiles that I showed you yesterday, and it's gonna get a bunch of clams, numbered and marked clams. Thank you. You're welcome. This team doesn't have much time. Everything has to be in place before the tide rises again. Oysters and clams in the cages will be protected, but they won't know that. Researchers are going to measure the fear factor. To allow exposure of clams and oysters to predators, but not access. So in other words, they can smell and see the predators, but not be eaten by them. We call that the ecology of fear. The ecology of fear. That's I right. like that. <laughs> the, the example I like to give is um, if you have an owl flying over a field. Right. It can, it can fly down and it can eat one mouse, and it decreases that mouse population by one. But at the same time that it's doing that, it's also scaring 100 mice in that field. And those mice are stopping feeding, and they're hiding, and they're doing a lot of things differently. Or perhaps leaving the field. Leaving the field. So those, those effects can be much more far-reaching and pervasive than the actual predation event itself. Just the fear of the predator can cause a lot of the effects that we see. And is this something that ecologists have just kind of started thinking about? In about the last decade or so, it's really come uh, into fuller recognition. It's something we need to take note of. It's one of many things that will be measured here. It looks like a pretty spot, doesn't it? Well, it gets ugly real fast when you get out of the boat and step into marsh mud, the likes of which I've never seen. Oh, no. Wow. This is like walking in quicksand. Whoa! <laughs> I'm stuck. It quickly becomes obvious that I will be of no help at all. I've got the wrong boots, and they won't let me go barefoot because a buried oyster shell can cut through your foot like a razor blade. You getting your mud feet? Am I getting my mud feet? Are you kidding? No one else is moving fast in this stuff. And the clock is ticking. What are you putting in there now? These are our uh, individually marked and measured juvenile clams. 
the ones that I showed you in the lab yesterday that have the B tags on them. Oh, yeah. The clams are being liberated and tiles with spat are being placed. This same experiment is taking place all along the southeast coast. It involves researchers from Florida State University, UGA, and the University of North Carolina. I mean, it's such tedious work. Like, what's the point? What is the point? I, I ask mean, my crew. <laughs> on behalf of your students, I will ask you the question, what is the point? <laughs> what we're really interested in understanding is um, what controls the function of oyster reefs. Okay. So oyster reefs do a lot of what we call ecosystem services for us. We think of them often in terms of them providing food, because obviously they do that. Um, but we also know that they do things like providing essential fish habitat. Perhaps even more importantly, they help balance the excess nitrogen from things like fertilizers. They do this when they filter water through their bodies. With so many oyster reefs in decline, scientists are trying to figure out why and reverse the trend. How do the crabs play into all of this? There are certain crabs, like mud crabs, which love to eat oysters and when they're crawling all over a reef, they're both eating the oysters and they also might be scaring the oysters, that ecology of fear we talked about, and making them behave differently. They want to know how the oyster-crab relationship varies throughout the southeast and how different predator combinations might control the health of marshes and estuaries. All right, the, the first three cages have all been clammed. Not bad, I can make it there. The tide is moving up quickly, and there is still a lot of work to do. One more. This one right here? Mm -hmm. So 76 is going in ABC. The cages have to be sealed. 81, this one? 81. Thank you. Any crabs or snails inside must be extracted, and none of that can be done underwater. It's close, but the work gets done. Oh, thank you. Who's ready to swim? I just swam. Yeah, man. Meanwhile, research on migratory birds gives another perspective on the importance of crabs. Georgia has about 378,000 acres of salt marsh, a rich environment that supports a wide range of wildlife. Shorebirds, like the wimbrel, are a good example. This beautiful bird is a species of concern because its numbers have declined. We tagged along with biologists Brad Wynn and Tim Kyes on Osaba Island to track, tag, and outfit one of the birds with a special transmitter. You know where she goes on the planet? This goes to a satellite. This is a little solar panel right here on the top. And this, there's satellites that are specific to, to these guys, and they will pick up the transmission from wherever she is. These transmitters have shown that wimbrels travel remarkable distances. Look at that wing, look at the shape of the wing. That's a, that's, a, that's a long distance wing right there. For example, one bird flew from Virginia to Canada more than 3,000 miles nonstop. Um, let's have a couple photos. Photo this ops. bird came from somewhere in South America. It could have been Anybody anywhere think? from Venezuela to Argentina. We got to do everything, get all the hardware. This bird is loaded. All right, you ready, guys? That's a very good sign. So wherever that bird goes, from here to Canada, to Alaska, to Seattle, wherever it ends up, 
who will have an understanding of, of location and, and it will actually have a good understanding for a few days before it migrates of its use of the Georgia coast as well. One Georgia bird fitted with a transmitter like the one you just saw flew straight from Canada down and through Hurricane Irene in 2011 before landing safely in Bermuda. They are amazing birds and depend on these crabs. Think of Georgia's coast as a big truck stop on the highway from South America to the Arctic. This is the gas station where they refuel before they make those incredible journeys. But yeah, the, the food resources there, are, uh, I mean, look at this. This is, this is what the Wimbrels are eating right here. We're in a Salicornia salt marsh. There is a, a, an abundance of these uh, fiddler crabs that uh, is, is un, we, we, we can't measure. Um, uh, there's so many crabs in this marsh and it's so rich. Uh, these birds stop off and in, in, um, in about four weeks of eating these crabs and eating a lot of them because there's so many here and they're so accessible to the birds, um, they, they put on enough weight uh, to build the muscle they need to put on enough fat to go all the way up to the high, uh, fairly cold climate of the Arctic to nest, but these, are, these little creatures are pretty fascinating and spectacular uh, in themselves, but as far as the wimbrel goes, this is fuel. Crabs do more than feed birds and fish. They also keep the marsh healthy. Most of the grass you see here is called spartina, or cord grass. As the stems of Spartina die and the tide comes in and washes all of it into a mass of brown sticks, the decaying grass becomes a nutrient for the marsh. It breaks down gradually, so the marsh almost feeds itself. But the crabs also eat away at this decaying Spartina and break it down even faster. On Sapelo Island, more research is taking place with a different kind of crab. The focus is on marsh crabs. Safra Altman spends hours, days, weeks just trapping crabs to see how far upland they go. The discovery of a crab that lives outside the muck of the marsh could extend the parameters of what scientists consider a marsh to be. In a larger context, we're trying to look at, we're, we're measuring a bunch of different variables that we think may be responsible for why we see crabs at certain sites and not others, and why at certain sites the crabs may move farther into the woods than in, in other places. Another part of the experiment is to learn what eats these crabs. Altman creates the equivalent of a leash around the crab body. We want to tie it so that we're not getting in the way of its function. We want it, it to be secure but not change the way it acts so that any kind of predator um, wouldn't think something was wrong with the crab. It can move, but once she attaches it to a stake, it won't go far. It's tough stuff for the crab being sacrificed, but they need more data because so little is known about this species or what eats it. Research continues on a wide variety of crabs across the globe. There is still so much to be learned. We tend to think of crabs as little more than a good meal, but as you've seen, they play an important role in the environment. If you didn't have any crabs, a building block of the whole ecosystem would be gone. There's a line from a movie in the 70s about insects that applies to crabs as well. It is the mistake of arrogance to equate size with significance. Some ocean crabs are huge. They can weigh up to 40 pounds. But we discovered a world of little crabs right under our feet. And without them, the entire coastal ecosystem would suffer. I'm Sharon.